Hi everybody, uh, it's Joel. I just got back from a trip to the UK, London and Scotland, all over Scotland. And I've been a bit under the weather lately, so I thought I would take this opportunity to talk about the shows I saw in London. Um, just as a record for me, just what those experiences were like. Before I kind of, you know, the memory fades into the ether and I kind of start to forget them. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So the first show we saw was uh, The Importance of Being Earnest. Um, and this was a show put on by the Bumbriest players. Of, and if I don't have specific actors or cast names or director names or anything like that, uh, it's because London theaters tend to charge you for the program. Yeah, I don't understand it. Uh, so I, I won't have a record and I apologize for the talented people who put all these uh, shows and plays on. This was this was a, a, a really good show. Um, we really wanted to see this particular play because obviously it's a it's a brilliant play, it's a classic, it's still funny, it's still relevant. Um, and we wanted to see, you know, a typically English play in its homeland, in England. And, um, and this was a play, of course, all about, you know, the English society and the upper class and all of the silliness and foibles and, you know, the shallow, superficial kind of artifices that come with that. It was done in the conceit that, oh, this was like a dress rehearsal kind of thing um, for, for a show that was going on. Uh, and the play was kind of done as if you were watching a dress rehearsal, you know, on one of the sets in the play. Um, and this was done for mainly two reasons. There are a few jokes that they that they wanted to work in uh, there that specifically dealt with oh you're you're kind of watching a play being put on. There's a lot of plays like that. Um, but mainly it was it was kind of all for this one line. It's because uh, this cast, this company, were all you know older actors. All older actors in these roles where I, I think Sicily is supposed to be something like 16 or 18, something like that. Um, so all older actors playing these younger roles. And there was this one line one of the company members said, it, and like they were saying, are we, are we too old to still be doing this, to still be doing the importance of being earnest? And they basically said, no, we're, we're doing it because we love it. And they said, and the audience doesn't notice things like age anyway. And quite honestly, if they hadn't brought attention to it, I probably wouldn't have. Because this was a really, really solid cast. And even though uh, the performers weren't necessarily all that young, they really acted young. Some of them really acted like they had the mannerisms of like a, a naive, you know, teenage socialite. Um, the women in particular, like, j they just would have these mannerisms that made them feel really young. All the performances were strong across the board. All of the uh, wonderful, wonderful cast. Even like minor bit cart parts. Like uh, I can't remember, but the preacher's name. He cracked me up. Uh, just, just a, just a hilarious performance. Really over the top. The the whole kind of you're watching the the play within a play behind the scenes kind of thing. It, it was uh, pragmatic in some certain respects, like they had one living room set, but uh, there's a scene that's supposed to take place outdoors in the garden. And obviously they didn't have the budget or the ability to change an entire set. So when it came time for that scene, they're like, "Are we gonna Are we gonna do the set change now? No, no, we'll just we'll just mime it for now, kind of thing." So that was their way of getting around, and I was fine with that. It's you know you obviously it'd be hard to build you know an entire other set for one scene. So that was their way of going around it. And they put all their efforts into the living room set. And it was very nicely lit as well. It was nicely decorated, nicely lit. Some props would always be missing or not there at the right time. Like he was always yelling, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? And then there's a line in the, and this is like a running gag through the play. And there was a line in the play that came up where, good heavens, where are the cucumber sandwiches? And at this point, the prop had actually arrived. And so stuff like that was funny and got a genuine laugh. Um, and there were other things like they would ask a character their age and they would just look at the audience and almost like kind of winkingly be like, I'm 29 and clearly they're not kind of thing playing off that. So that stuff was all fun, but you kind of didn't really need it. It, w it was extra. Some, it was, I was fine with it when it was actually 
being funny and they're actually putting new jokes in there and it was actually getting a laugh because I mean if it gets a laugh it's justified right but um yeah in general it, it wasn't needed it didn't really hurt the performance but it it didn't necessarily help it as well the direction of the show was fantastic because the energy there's so much energy there's so much running back and forth and like people crossing other sides and like jumping and running and you you don't think it's a really energetic play it's, it's kind of just a sitting and talking play there are some scenes that are deliberately people sitting and talking and that's that's the main thrust of it but there was a lot of energy in this and the lines were delivered whip fast like it was fantastic and of course the script is really really tight the only real issues i had with the pacing is when the script kind of slowed it down but that's again that's kind of a catch-22 because that's the kind of nature of this play it's drawing attention to the fact that these people are all kind of boring and they all just talk about these boring dull stupid inane superficial things and they place such importance on it it's basically an episode of Seinfeld just written you know years and years before that it's the proto Seinfeld really it's a bunch of people going on and making a big deal about nothing and just being so shallow and superficial and really these are kind of horrible characters when you think about them there's not much redeeming there um i guess their only saving grace is they don't really know any better and that's how you get around it but yeah it was uh it was a fantastic fantastic show um really glad i saw it we sat really close and i was great because these actors were working and you could tell it and it was it was just great to like see every nuance in their performances um i'm glad there's some shows we were sitting farther back i'm glad for this show we were sitting like front row uh it was fantastic um brilliant show bumbrae's players importance of being earnest the next show we saw was the very famous and very long running mousetrap i've seen some lists that say it's the longest running um west end show of all time um and what i'd like to ask in regards to that is how has this thing been running that long <laughs> if i'm being a little cruel um yeah I, I i don't get it i i don't get why this is such a popular show it's a perfectly serviceable play in its own right uh but i i just don't get why it's such a popular sh show I'm not going to go into too much detail about the story in this one, uh, just because they do swear you to oath at the end of the play not to reveal the secret, because it is a mystery, and I take that oath very seriously, so I won't do that. But um, I will just talk about the ins and outs of it. So, what I liked about it was I liked all of the cliches. I liked all the mystery cliches. You have this 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 old like kind of hotel and oh it's our first day opening. It's our first day running a hotel kind of thing. And then all of these weird characters come in by one by one. There's the man in the dark coat with the funny accent, and then there's the bitter old lady, and then there's the general. You gotta have the army general, and just all these weird characters keep trickling in one by one by one and of course it's a very sl snowy day and they're cut off from the outside world and of course the policeman the detective is the only one who can make it there because he has a pair of skis but then the pair of skis go missing and, and all this stuff right um and yeah those cliches were just fun i was just kind of laughing to myself sometimes i was laughing out loud when nobody else was just because how cliched it was but it was charming is what it was it was it was just kind of charming to see all these mystery tropes because like they almost weren't cliches they were almost just kind of tropes of the genre and if you wanted to see a typical Agatha Christie style mystery on the stage I mean this was it this was exactly this was exactly what it was advertised to be I expected it to be more lighthearted but it goes into some darker territory with you know there's children involved and murder and stuff like that so it does get a little dark because these characters are really comical and cartoonish you don't expect them to have serious moments or as serious moments and they kind of do it's, it's really slow paced which isn't necessarily a plot problem because it's it's developing things one by one again characters come in one by one and and it's kind of like a slow build and there's very little music the only piece of music is uh i think there's a couple songs on the radio and there's three blind mice played on the piano um but yeah very little music so it's it's kind of very atmospheric and there will be a lot of moments where 
uh, you know, a character would be in a room and then they would go out of the room and there'd be no one on stage and then they would come back alone and they'd, like, have a vacuum cleaner or something. They'd be dusting or polishing up. Um, so, yeah, very, very slow-paced, completely different from Importance of Being Earnest, where it's just like a whip. We saw it at the end of a, a really long day, a lot of walking in this day, had a heavy meal before because we were really, really hungry, sat down in these tiny cramped seats, and the theater is boiling, and it, the lights go off, and it was very sleep-inducing. I, I do believe I had to pinch myself a couple times to keep myself awake, and I'd had a coffee before that, so... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not an enthralling play, and um, my my kind of biggest issue with it was just the kind of, I guess, just the kind of nature of it. I'm not really big on uh, murder mysteries and stuff like that. Um, I was fine when it was just kind of, you know, being lighthearted and hear these kooky characters and all the trappings of it, whatever. But then when it was getting more serious, that's when it kind of fell apart to me. I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it kind of just seems pulled out of thin air. You know what I mean? It's not really something... Like, you could probably guess it just be, being like, oh, this is like the, the cliché, stereotypical thing they always do in murder mysteries, and they just kind of pull it out of nowhere. So you could guess it that way, but it, it's not really explained. Uh, the play is set up in such a way that anyone could have done it everybody has a mysterious past and everybody could be lying about who they are kind of thing and so really you're getting all this information but you're getting no information at the same kind my favorite mysteries are the ones where you can look at it and even if you guess it even if you're able to guess it because it's easy that shows that the person writing it has put in all those clues that you can actually follow them if you're just guessing at cliches that's not really a well constructed mystery i hear it's different from the book i don't know i can't comment on the book uh but as the play is as a mystery it's kind of and there were some elements i did guess in there just because you know they were a little obvious or whatever, but there were some plot elements that came completely out of left field, out of nowhere. And I really don't like that. I just find that lazy. I don't get what the appeal is with this one. It's perfectly serviceable. I don't get how it's run for like 40 years or 60 years or whatever it is. It's, it's just not that good. Uh, it's easily the weakest play I saw. Um, the set was nice. The actors were fine. The pacing was really slow. Uh, just kind of the story is where it fell down um and yeah that that was the mousetrap show number three i saw uh and this one actually had a cast list how about that a complimentary cast list from the play that was playing at the national theater by new play by richard bean called great britain and this play i wanted to see for a few reasons. Um, first of all, uh, it's starring Billy Piper, and she's a very, very, very solid actress, does an amazing job in this show. Uh, so I wanted to see it for that reason. Uh, the other was uh, kind of the subject matter and the writer. The writer, uh, Richard Bean, did, uh, I think it was called One Man, Two Governors, which I did not see, but friends of mine saw in New York and said was very, very, very funny, and that toured for a a, a whole long while. Um, so it had that going for it. Uh, also, the subject matter was interesting to me. It was a story about local politics, about a phone hacking scandal in the tabloids, based based in some truth, but, um, you know, other elements were made up, and I don't know about enough about the story to know what was real and what wasn't, but it was based on true events of this phone hacking scandal that this uh, tabloid went into. Um, and centered around the kidnapping and murder of these two twins. Um, and that's the basic premise. Um, so I was interested. I kind of wanted, like, I wanted to see a play, again, I wanted to see shows that were, uh, you know, typically Brit British or, you know, something I wouldn't get at home. Uh, something that wasn't necessarily going to tour home or anything like that. Uh, and this was, uh, this was good because it was a modern play about current, politics and i'm interested in that stuff i'm interested in local politics so it, it's kind of hard to tackle because this play there's a whole mess of things going on uh but basically the whole thing is um it, it centers around tabloid journalists and um just the kind of process they have to do getting their stories they have a person for example 
I think his name was Jimmy the Bins or something like that. Uh, and he would go around and check in people's trash to see if he could find any dirty laundry from the stuff people thrown out. And it was basically examining um, kind of the relationship between politicians, the tabloids, and the police, and how they're all kind of interlinked and in bed with each other. They were looking for basically the father, the father of these two twins, because everybody thought they that he had done it, and. Um, so they kind of knew where he was, but the police weren't moving on it. And uh, they had an agreement with the tabloids to only move in uh, after the tabloids had got a story ready and an interview ready so that they would be the ones to break the story. The, the kind of driving force of the play was that they discovered a way to basically hack, it, hack into people's voicemail, uh, basically because people don't, depending on the provider, you can find out the default voicemail pin. And so long as you enter that voicemail pin, you have access and and under the assumption that people don't change their defaults, which people generally don't do, is that you can hack in with the default voicemail code pin and basically listen to everybody's voicemail. So they were getting all the this information at this tabloid, the free press, that all their competitors and other newspapers weren't able to have access to. So they were getting all this information first and they were finding out everybody's dirty laundry. So they kind of had, you know, pol they had one over on certain politicians um, and like they had, they had information on the police and they were able to control certain situations and they made friends in high places, of course. Um, so all of that stuff was really interesting. I knew going into this, it would be a satire. Um, I didn't necessarily think it would be as lowbrow as it went. Sometimes it kind of just went for the dick joke, you know what I mean? Uh, and once or twice that's fine, but I mean, in the first act especially, it was happening all the time. A lot of local humor, a lot of uh, local, like humor directed towards a London audience. There were some references that went right over my head, which is fine. Uh, kind of comes with the territory. It's interesting because uh, the theater culture in New York is very much for the tourists, but in the West End, it seems to be a nice mix of locals and tourists. And I would say Toronto is about the same. There's a, there's a significant London population, and certainly at this show, it was mostly Londoners or, you know, people from the UK. I didn't expect it to be as lowbrow as it was, and I would have liked it if it had been a little more, um, I don't want to say high-minded satirical, because that just sounds stuffy, but a little more insightful satirical than it was. Uh, most of these characters, by and large, are cartoon characters, and they're played very much as, we're played and written as cartoon characters. The journalist Paige Britton is basically a character who, you know, doesn't learn, doesn't learn, has no remorse, doesn't develop. She's basically just kind of a despicable character, but despicable all the way through. You know, she doesn't get any... Maybe she gets a bit worse, but not really. She kind of just stays in that same ballpark. Um, and generally that's fine for a supporting character, but you want there, you want there to be something. You want there to be some change in your main character. Uh, and again, it was written well, and it was played very well by Billy Piper. She's very, she's very, very talented in this role. Very, very strong cast. There, there were some people I recognized, but I don't know from where. The, uh, the politician, the conservative leader, uh, Jonathan Way, played by Rupert Van Sitter. I feel like I've seen him in everything. He was very good in this role. They're all pretty much good across the board, but he was very good in this role. Um, yeah, but most of the characters just come across as cartoonish. You have the tabloid editor-in-chief who, you know, swears a lot and is very crass and is very rough, and they have, like, anytime somebody screws up, they have a contest called Cunt of the Month, and they write cunt across their forehead, and stuff like that. So, so he's a very crass, very boisterous man. He becomes, uh, like, a, a PR for the, um, uh, for the politician. In the play, I want to say like Joe Biden or something like that, you know, just like you have like the conservative guy over here and then you have his very like very loud kind of spokesman counterpart. He was kind of like that. And then you have the, the editor who's put in charge of the paper, who's a woman who loves horses and social justice and stuff like that and is completely oblivious to everything going on. By and large, cartoon characters, the one character I'd say who probably wasn't, I mean, there's a few. But uh, the one character I'd say who probably wasn't is the uh, p police commissioner, Sully Kassam, played by Aaron Neal. 
And this was a guy who I feel like I've seen in the news a whole bunch of times, especially in Toronto with all the Rob Ford stuff going on. But I've seen this guy in the news a lot of times. It's the guy who, you know, is a public servant who does a job who every time he's put in front of a camera finds new and brilliant ways to put his foot in his mouth. Uh, like there was a moment he was saying that, yeah, we're very saddened by the fact that there are more black people shot by police officers uh, on record than there are white people. And then he says, but I intend to correct that kind of thing. And it's like, he, he'd have he'd have gaffes like that all across the board. And you feel really bad for this guy because he is being completely played by A, his force, who use him as kind of a fall guy, and B, the tabloids, who use him, again, as a fall guy just to kind of get what they want. They want to get him out and get a police commissioner in who can work with them kind of thing. And this guy, like, he's he's ripe for that because he's just, he's really clueless. And he's not necessarily malicious, but he's just, he's clueless. And every time he's put in front of the camera, he does the wrong thing and puts his foot in his mouth. They, they get him at one point. This was kind of hyperbolic, but it was fine. They get him at one point to... You know, he, he keeps being found it keeps being found out that he's he's East Indian and he keeps uh, tasering black people. So it doesn't really bode well politically, but it keeps happening again and again. He keeps end up tasering black people. So he volunteers to be tasered and it goes about as well as you could expect. The set was very interesting. Basically a big open stage and you have these there are three large glass screens. Okay? and kind of to simulate uh, an office space. So behind these glass screens, you'd have desks, and they'd be mic'd when they were behind the screens and stuff, just to kind of symbolize an office workplace. Uh, but there were smart glass, so every once in a while, like a news clip or like the spinning headlines would appear in the tabloid, tabloid reports and stuff like that. And they would appear on these glasses, their screens, and they would travel across the stage and characters would look back and, and see news reports kind of traveling across the stage. Uh, and the most interesting use of this was, uh, again, this character, Sully Kassam. Um, all of his gaffes were basically uh, turned into memes. And so you'd have him putting his foot in his mouth, and he'd be on loop, and they'd be doing silly graphics with him. And it was very, it was very interesting. It was very funny. It was, it was a neat use of the technology and a neat use of the set design. I would describe this play as having something I call intermission syndrome, which is usually where your play has either a strong first act or a strong second act. This had definitely a strong second act, and I could kind of see that. Like, in the beginning of the play, there were a lot of scenes that just kind of spun their wheels. Like, the the owner of the tabloid, who was kind of like the Rupert Murdoch character, um, they basically all, like, kind of have lunch on his yacht or whatever, and they're just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze. It was, it, like, nothing was really developed in the scene. It was just kind of uh, an excuse for the characters to, you know, have some witty repartee and, you know tell some crude jokes and stuff like that. And it, it kind of didn't progress the plot forward. And oh, many of the scenes felt symptomatic of that. All of this was kind of like a slow build. And, you know, they, they have success. They break the story. And that's kind of how the first act end. And the second act is the fun part. It's the part with all the consequences. It's the part with everything coming crashing down on their heads. Because what they're doing is essentially illegal, right? How they're obtaining this information, even if it's, even if it's good information. And it, they're trying to find these two girls that went missing. Uh, but, so yeah, the second act is much stronger because all the really bad stuff happens. And, you know, you start to see people panicking. And, like, the police finally crack down on the paper and start arresting people. They finally start losing all their allies. The way it ends is basically Paige Britton runs away to America and becomes, like, a late-night host kind of thing. So it shows, like... And, and there was, like, a headline saying she did six months in prison or something like that. So it shows this kind of thing just goes on. And just the media frenzy and circus. How these people just reinvent themselves and find new ways to, like just casually destroy people to make the byline you know um it was great it was very satirical uh it was a lot of fun very well acted very interesting stage i wish it had tried to be a little less clever 
and been a little more intellectual, been a little more kind of critical about what it was doing. Sometimes it just went for the crude joke, and it's like, you could have used this moment to develop character or look into these events a little with a little more scrutiny. Um, so that was a bit of a shame, but I mean, it definitely wasn't a bad play. It was a very good play. Um, and again, that second act, things kick up, and everything comes crashing down, and it's great fun. Yeah, so that was uh, Great Britain. And last, but not least, was Trafalgar Studios 1 production of Richard III, featuring Martin Freeman as Richard III. Now I want you to picture, if you will, Martin Freeman playing Richard III. That's exactly what this show was. E everything you're picturing in your mind when I'm saying that, that's what it was. And yes, it was as awesome as you're thinking. Um, off, right off the bat, I think Martin Freeman is definitely of the more prolific uh, uh, British actors. I think he's, he's, you know, in the top ten of the ones that are, like, known and well-known and do television and movies and stuff like that and make it across the pond to North America. I, I think he's one of the best ones working. He just is. He does more with a glance sometimes than actors do with an entire script. He's just that good, and he's that good in this role. It's him being maniacal and manipulative and villainous and just yelling at people and running after people and strangling them with a phone cord and, you know, all of that wonderful stuff. A lot of criticisms about this, I saw some reviews, some criticisms about this uh, performance in particular was that he's not, he's not charismatic in the role and that he doesn't seem like he would actually be able to convince anybody of anything. Uh, and my response to that is, it's Martin Freeman. He's a charismatic man. He's charismatic in his own way. Just, he's such a personable guy, really, when you see him. He's just such a personable, regular, ordinary, funny guy that you just see him and you are kind of taken in by him. He's not charismatic in the way like uh, a Trudeau was or uh, Churchill or any of those figures, like any like great orators who could really speak kind of thing. But... He's charismatic in just how personable he is. And he's just, he's such a likable, like in all of his performances, he's just so likable. You just, you just grow such an affection for this guy that he's totally charismatic and he could, he could totally charm his way into that position. He, he does the whole, oh, poor me thing really well. And he's got that here. It's him as that character and it's, it's brilliant. Let's talk a little bit about the direction of the piece. Some elements better than others. Uh, the the kind of design of it was it was very obvious that it was set in the 1970s. All the men are like like 1970s businessmen or uh, you know business suits and like that particular hairstyle where it was kind of slicked back and kind of the sideburns and stuff like that and the mustaches and the horn rim glasses like it became very evident that this was set in the 70s the reason why wasn't that good there's really no reason for this setting is kind of the problem and i was reading an article about it later and the direct it, it like it made it seem like the director said oh this is the winter of our discontent well there was a lot of content discontent in the 1970s so they kind of chose that, and it, yeah, it doesn't really elaborate on it or make good use of that. So you're basically in a in an office tower on like the ninth floor or something like that. There's elevator doors that open, um, and like there are these there are these uh, desks all set up in a row, and they have like little mics there they can talk into. I almost thought it was like a UN or something like that because they kept talking into each other into these mics across the table but then the very first scene they're cheering like like a big merger or acquisition just happened uh so yeah the setting wasn't really concrete and this set never changes eh sometimes they would be in a different location like obviously you know people get locked in the tower and murdered in the tower in this play and they'd still kind of be in the office you know what i mean like that set wouldn't change for that or, or, you know, the, the scene with, um, 
uh, Lady Anne, bemoaning the death of her husband, uh, rolls him out on the slab. The slab is just in the office. For some reason, there's a slab with a cadaver on it in an office. Like, it's never it's never explained. Like, you can assume she's in a morgue, but... Um, and generally, that's not a problem, but... Where he reluctantly takes the crown and, um... You know, Buckingham is picking him up to the people and saying, Oh, won't you take it? Won't you take it? And he's delivering this, this uh, speech with a mic and almost in the way a Pentecostal preacher would kind of thing. Uh, in maybe one in front of like an evangelical audience or something like that on TV, these programs that you see, and like referring to the audience and saying, won't you do this in front of all these people and all this stuff. And I was kind of like, where are we? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, where are we supposed to be right now? Like, where is this, like, is this supposed to be being broadcast on TV? Like, who are we, the audience, supposed to be watching this? Are we citizens or public? Like, stuff like that was never made clear. The focus of the play wasn't the setting. The fight choreography, really, really good. Like, really, really good. Like, it wasn't stagey the way, I'll, you know, you'll see the actor and they'll go, and there's a pause and the other guy goes, ah! And I'll see that even in, in big productions, right? And there's... It's mostly because there's only so much you can get away with on stage without actually hurting people. Like, I mean, rex wrestlers go for the broke, but I mean, you can't really expect actors to do that. They're not trained to do that. There were moments, like, every anytime somebody charged at somebody to tackle them, like, they'd be near you, so you weren't, you didn't know if somebody was going to fall, like, right on the floor at your feet and stuff like that. So you'd be jumping back. So it was a neat way to get people involved. This fight choreography was really good. It was really fast. It was really quick. It made good use of the locations. People would be, like, running over desks and, like, grabbing people. And people would be falling on the floor. And, and, and just, like, the struggle seemed really, really real every time they were going for it. Trying to create that feel that, you know, a Shakespearean audience would have enjoyed was they come to see these people get off. These famous historical figures from their history, they come to see, you know, the Ten Little Indians thing. They're all going down one by one by one by one. And that's part of the fun of it. And recreating that fun is really important in a play like this. And they did that really, really well. Some gimmicky stuff too, which I'm okay with. They, I was warned before, I got an email before, because we were, again, we were in the front row. Uh, but we got an email saying, that uh, there are blood splatters in this play. So if you're in the front row, they, they will provide, you know, it washes out, but we'll provide you protective rain gear and stuff like that. Um, and it only really, like, I expected it to be, like, the way they worded it, I expected it to be, like, all through the performance. There would just be, like, guts and gore flying there. And that's fine. That's, uh, that's a perfectly legitimate way to take a play like this because it just, it, it is a straight up, you know, I'm going to stab my way to the throne kind of thing. So I thought they were going to go that route. They didn't really. Um, so I think it was a bit overhyped. Um, and there was one moment where I think it was Buckingham's neck was slashed when he finally gets his comeuppance. And, um, you know, the blood flies out of his neck, again, like Tarantino, like into the audience. And people before beside me got splattered a little bit. And there was a little bit on the floor. But um, apart from that one moment, there was really nothing. What I really liked about this play was they made it clearly all about the character Margaret, who's not necessarily a big character in the play itself, but um, even when she... They, they, went, they went in a neat direction with her in two ways. Uh, she enters the play, and everybody's, like, backing up. Like, almost like the circle game, you know, where one person's on one side, one person's on the other. She'd be here. Everybody is moving around the set in the opposite direction of where she is. Everybody's scared of her, and you don't know why. At first you think it's just like, oh, it's like the old the old mother figure who you never cross the old mother figure because she's just intimidating, even though she can't physically do anything towards you, but she's she's just intimidating just the way she is and you don't cross her at first you think it's like that and then you know the character margaret she's always you know cursing people a curse on you a curse on you mainly i think that's just supposed to be like the curses of an old woman kind of thing they turn out to be true in the play but i i think it's mainly supposed to be like oh it's like an old woman like uh, a pox on you fie on you that kind of thing where it's just words, it's just vicious words. But in this play, they straight up make Margaret a witch. 
they make her, you know, full-blown voodoo magic witch. She enters and she speaks into it. There are mics all around again. She grabs one of the mics, starts speaking into it. Sparks fly up from the TV and the lights start flickering. And then eventually all the lights go out except for a light on her. And then she starts speaking her curses. Like, they made her full-on witch in it. I thought that was really interesting. It made that seem really fun. So when... When Gloucester is actually calling her witch and hag, he means it because she's literally a witch. Um, that said, she's still uh, the product of a fallen house. And, you know, the first time you see her, she's she's sitting in, uh, she's she begins on the stage and she's sitting almost in a hallway. And you see a picture of, a fallen picture of the old king and uh, a picture of the new king, King Edward is on the wall behind her and she's just sitting looking worried as the play progresses like she's curled up she she's sitting in front of the tv watching events unfold um and later on she'll be curled up like a homeless woman on a bench and then eventually when they find her and um you know elizabeth goes to her and says um teach me to curse the way you curse you know teach me to curse my enemies they find her on the ground uh, like she's homeless, she's destitute. And, you know, anytime there's a dream sequence or they're like, I remember the words of Margaret, she'll appear and there'll be smoke and she'll be saying those curses again kind of thing. So she's the protagonist of this piece, of the way they went with the direction. I thought that was really interesting because uh, if you think about the play and a lot of other Shakespearean plays, it's about order and a lot about who should be in power, who's supposed to be in power. She enters and says to Elizabeth, you've taken my place, you know, you've taken what is rightfully mine. So it's not only that um, that um, Richard and the Yorks uh, and Edward and the Yorks don't deserve to be there. The Lancasters don't either, really. Um, and Margaret is the one, Margaret and her house are the ones who are supposed to be there. And uh, it finishes this really nicely because when Richmond eventually takes the crown, he does his ending speech. But he does it maniacally, like he's becoming there. He's on he's on the television and he's delivering an address in front of a British flag and everything like that. It's just like, oh, it's the king's new address. And then the camera zooms into him, and this is playing on a little television that's just downstage, a little old wooden television like they'd have in the seventies. And it zooms in on his face, and he gets really sinister, and he's he's taking pleasure in it and talking about you know. Get death to the enemies and stuff like that. So it's almost like the cycle is repeating because the rightful people are still not in power. I really like that. I really like how it took those old Shakespearean themes, those new ideas, and really communicated them, really made it something people would understand. A lot of really good things were done with this piece. Um, again, the setting could have been toned up a little bit, but I mean, you know, you're pushing it aside for the blood and the violence and the characters and Martin Freeman just doing his thing, having a ball, you know, as, as Richard does.